if we would be friends with the world, if we would live in accordance with the wisdom of the world, we will find ourselves in ugly conflict with those around us. Now, that's what friendship with the world looks like. That's what it produces in human relationships and interactions. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller. Glad you're with us as we begin a message called Choosing the Right Friendship. And Jonathan, you talk about being friends with the world. Well, if there's a potential danger with that, what's the alternative? Well, James sets before us the alternative, and it's a beautiful thing here in this passage. He invites us to consider that we can be friends with God and that those who know God through faith in Jesus Christ are counted as his friends. And it's worth just pausing and allowing that thought to set in. I mean, friendship's a wonderful thing. We prize friendships. We invest in friendships. When someone counts us a friend, we know the value of that, or at least we ought to know the value of that. But the thought that the God of heaven and earth, the creator of the universe, would count us as his friends as we come to him through faith in Jesus, well, that is that's a breathtaking thing. But James wants us to understand that we have to choose. It's either friendship with the world or friendship with God. And uh, he sets those two before us as as a choice, as alternatives in a powerful way in our passage today. Well, that passage is the book of James, chapter 4. We're going to be in the first 10 verses. So grab a Bible, join us there as we begin our message, Choosing the Right Friendship. Here is Jonathan. I wonder where it is that your deepest loyalty lies. Most of us, of course, have overlapping sets of loyalties that we hold in balance that function on different levels and extend to different depths. At a pretty superficial level, as we consider this theme, we might have a loyalty plan with a particular airline or a loyalty card with a particular supermarket. We might have loyalty to a particular political party or to a union or to a professional association. At a more personal level, we might have loyalties to co-workers or employers, deeper loyalties to particular friends, and then deeper loyalties still to family members, siblings, children, our spouse. Here at the opening of chapter 4, James probes the question of where it is that our deepest loyalty lies. And he insists to us that the choice in that is ultimately a binary choice. It is between two options and two options only. He frames the issue in relational terms, in terms of friendship, even of marriage. And here's what it boils down to, he tells us. Either we will have ultimate loyalty to the world below or to the Lord above. Notice how very stark the choice is there in verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, back in the previous chapter, in chapter 3, James challenged us to consider whether we were truly wise. And if we claimed to be wise, he challenged us then to consider where it was our our, our wisdom came from. Is our wisdom really just the wisdom of the world, an earthly and an unspiritual wisdom A wisdom that drives us to pursue our own selfish interests? Or is our wisdom the wisdom that comes down from above? The wisdom that pursues peace and is marked by gentleness? The wisdom that is exemplified by the Lord Jesus himself? Well, here in our passage today in chapter 4, James is still really pursuing that contrast between the life marked by heaven's wisdom and the life marked by the wisdom of the world. But now he shifts the focus and he puts things in these relational terms. If he asked last time, what is the source of our wisdom? In our passage today, he asks, what is the true object of our loyalty or where is our true friendship? Is it with the world below or with the Lord above? Now, in forcing us to confront this question, James has a great deal to teach us about friendship with the world, what it's like, and why it's such a problem. And his first lesson for us is this. Friendship with the world, it causes fights among people. Verse 1 again, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Evidently, all was not terribly rosy within this particular Christian community, within this church. There were quarrels, there were 
fights among the believers, and I guess that shouldn't totally surprise us if we've been part of Christian community for any length of time. It won't surprise us. We know it can happen. We know that Christian community can easily fall short of a godly ideal. And James asks these believers where they think the problem lies. Why is it they are experiencing this and seeing this? More than a century ago, the Times newspaper in London posed the question, I think on the front page, what is wrong with the world? And in reply, the well-known author and intellectual G.K. Chesterton famously wrote to the editor this simple letter, Dear Sir, I am yours, G.K. Chesterton. It's a humble and an honest reply, and the Bible would teach us an accurate one. But it's not the answer we go to most readily. It's not the answer that we most easily volunteer. When James asks, you know, where is the problem within the fellowship? Where is the source of the fights? Where is the source of all the quarrels? You can just imagine the warring sides sort of gearing up to point the finger across the aisle at someone else. But James's answer is akin to Chesterton's. The problem is from within. I'm the problem. Is it not the case that your passions are at war within you. And that is, of course, the honest truth. Our fallen nature, our sinful nature, what the Bible calls our flesh, it is still within us even if we're saved, and it drives us to pursue self and to cast off restraint, to mistreat others when it suits us to do so in order to fulfill our own dreams and our own desires. And even when we come to Christ, even when we're made new by the Spirit, the old nature is not surgically removed. It fights on until the day that we die. Worse, the sinful nature within us, it is egged on, spurred on by the world's way of thinking, by the wisdom of the world that we considered last time. Remember the wisdom of the world. It produces in the heart, chapter 3 and verse 14, bitter jealousy, and selfish ambition, a zeal for our own interests, for our own pursuits, and those things lead ultimately, verse 16, to disorder and to every vile practice. That's what the wisdom of the world encourages, and it finds a ready reception in the sinful nature within every human heart. And when that is what is to be found within the heart, when it is the wisdom of the world that is then guiding the mind, here is what results. You, you want something, you don't get it, so it's aggression, it's violence toward others, whether metaphorically or and in spirit or literally and in action, it's even murder. You covet something, you can't lay your hand on it, so you fight and you quarrel till you get it. If we would be friends with the world if we would live in accordance with the wisdom of the world, we will find ourselves in ugly conflict with those around us. Now, that's what friendship with the world looks like. That's what it produces in human relationships and interactions. But it's not just our attitude and behavior on the horizontal plane with other people that is impacted by our friendship with the world. Much more significantly, our relationship with God above is undermined. Friendship with the world that not only causes fights among people, it makes people enemies of God. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called Choosing the Right Friendship, part of our series from the book of James called Doers of the Word. Now we're going to pause here, but we'll get back to the message in just a moment. You know, Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported program. We do depend on your generosity to keep Jonathan's teaching on the station and as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you for your support by sending you a book Jonathan has written. It's called The Ministry Medical. It's taking a look at the book of 2 Timothy. In this book, Paul gives instructions and a personal model for faithful ministry. And these things remain the standard for every generation. Though they were written to Timothy in the first instance, they're very much for us today. So if you're involved in ministry, a pastor, Bible teacher, a ministry leader, maybe a Sunday school teacher or Bible study leader, we'd love to get you a copy of this book because it's going to really boil down the instructions that Paul gives, the characteristics of his ministry and the things that he commends, and then give us a great opportunity to look at our own lives and ministry and see how they measure up. We'd love to send you a copy of this book as our way of saying thank you for your financial support. You can find out more or give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 
998-7884 or encounterthetruth.org. Well, if you joined us a little bit late, we're in the book of James, chapter 4, looking at the first 10 verses. So grab your Bible and meet us there as we get back to the message. Again, here's Jonathan. Friendship with the world that not only causes fights among people, it makes people enemies of God. Middle of verse 2. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You're, you're too busy with the wisdom of the world seeking your own interest to think to ask God to call upon Him. Or you're too embarrassed to ask Him for what you want because the thing that you're coveting, you know that He wouldn't approve of it. Or, or you do ask and you expect the doors of heaven to be flung open to you, verse 3, but you don't receive. The prayer isn't answered in the way that you want it to be answered because you're asking out of motives that are taken directly from the world's playbook, from earthly wisdom. You are asking wrongly to satisfy your selfish passions and God is just being used as a divine ATM and he's not particularly interested. Now, all this, it sounds pretty bad as we sort of lay it out like that and consider it, but we might be inclined to justify it or at least to minimize it. Yes, James, you know, thanks for mentioning these things. Now that you mention it, I, I suppose I have been a little bit self-focused, maybe even a little aggressive, my bad, slight loss of perspective. You know that happens from time to time. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little course correction, James. Thanks so much. And, and while we're busy kind of deflecting and slightly self-justifying, now suddenly James issues one of the strongest rebukes in all the Bible. He won't let us off the hook that easily. And we realize that what we thought was a minor foible, an error in perspective, is actually a spiritual crisis. It's nothing less than spiritual adultery. Verse 4, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Adultery is an ugly word that speaks of an ugly thing. It is shocking language. It evokes strong emotion, and rightly so. James knows it. And the choice of language here, it is deliberate. It is calculated. You see, in behaving in a worldly way, according to worldly wisdom, seeking our own interests and fighting for our own advantage, you know, we might think, oh, I've, I guess I've been a little bit selfish, you know, perhaps a little unspiritual even, but adulterous? <laughs> Come on, James. Oh, no, not I, we say. Adultery, that's, a, that's an ugly, that's a repugnant thing to do well beyond the pale. No, 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 James, you need to understand my, my behavior, it falls well be in, within the bounds of respectability. You need to understand that, James. I'm a respectable sort of person. My misdemeanors, if they are such, they fall within the category of the questionable but not the catastrophic, James. But James says no. James insists that this worldly outlook, this following of worldly wisdom, it is fundamentally a relational issue, it is a question of loyalty, it is a matter of faithfulness, and where there has been transgression, it is ultimately a matter of spiritual adultery. Now, in, in putting things this way, in these terms, James is tapping into a very deep seam of biblical teaching in which God is shown to be the husband of his redeemed people, a people who are called in turn to be his faithful bride. So God is the husband of Israel throughout the Old Testament. The church is the bride of Christ in the New we could do a big old Bible survey on this theme and see it woven through the Scriptures, but just in passing, let me mention a couple of references. Isaiah 54 and verse 5, For your Maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. Ephesians 5. And verse 25, that famous passage on Christian marriage, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. If we belong to Jesus if we have placed our trust in him, if we have been redeemed by his blood shed at the cross, we have then come into covenantal relationship with him. We are bound to him in a relationship of faithfulness and loyalty and affection, a relationship toward which earthly marriage points, even as a pale reflection. And James says, living according to worldly standards and worldly patterns, it is nothing short of unfaithfulness, of adultery, Friendship with the world is enmity with God. 
See, God, he, he isn't interested in sharing our heart, our affections, our loyalty. This is an exclusive relationship, and we've got to choose. Middle of verse 4. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. There are certain types of relationship, of course, that are non-exclusive relationships. Being a friend of Simon doesn't mean you can no longer be a friend of Robert. Being a loyal customer at the Home Depot doesn't mean that you can never step inside a Lowe's store. (laughs) These are open relationships. But some relationships are not open. They are exclusive relationships. And marriage is the prime example of that, whatever the world might say at the present time. As we can all appreciate, treating an exclusive relationship as a non-exclusive relationship, it leads to disaster, it leads to wreckage, it ultimately leads to the destruction of the relationship. The Lord wants us to know and he wants us to understand that our relationship with him is an exclusive kind of a relationship. Our loyalty to him must be absolute. We, we are then in a position where we got to choose, each one of us. We can either pursue friendship with the world or we can pursue friendship with God, but we cannot pursue both. I remember once a preacher speaking of this dynamic in terms of attempting to do the spiritual splits. Down the river, down the Rideau near our home, there's a boat launch with a little dock. And during the summer, people are coming and going there all day on nice days, launching boats and loading their families into the boat for a day out on the river. And it can be quite entertaining, actually, just to watch the goings-on down there on a lazy summer afternoon. Now, inevitably, whenever you have a boat and a dock, what will happen from time to time is that a person will be in the process of stepping onto the boat or stepping off the boat. And while they're doing that, the boat will start drifting away from the dock. You've seen it happen. Maybe you've experienced that. Perhaps it wasn't tied up properly. Perhaps a large wave came along just as they were stepping on. And you know full well that the situation cannot be maintained for very long without being resolved. (laughs) The hapless person has one foot on the dock and one foot in the boat And the two are growing further and further and further apart. And quite intentionally, but nonetheless quite amusingly, they find themselves doing the literal splits. Pretty soon they will need to commit both feet to one place or things will end rather awkwardly for them. (laughs) I suspect there will be a number here among us, even today, who imagine that it is possible to keep a foot in two places. To have a foot in the kingdom of this world and a foot in the kingdom of God, who imagine that it is possible in the long term to maintain the spiritual splits, to keep that going for a good long time. You may not have thought of it in those particular terms, but essentially, if that is what you're doing, that is the reality of it. You know, you've got your sense of commitment to the Lord. You believe that the gospel is true, and you want to be saved. You're even willing to serve him in some ways. But you have drunk pretty deeply at the well of the wisdom of the world. You know that the passions for self, the passions to please yourself and to fulfill your own personal ambitions and to get your own way, the desires for the things that you want and the determination to do whatever it is you need to do to get those things, to push others out of your way to obtain them, these, these drive you. And they shape your, your life more than you would like to admit. You've got, a, you've got a foot in the Lord's camp, okay. And you've got a foot in the world's camp. And you'd like to play both sides. And you think you're flexible enough maybe to get, get away with it. You, you've assumed for a good long time that you are getting away with it. And you will get away with it with this half-hearted commitment to the Lord. And you've assumed, you know, he's not going to notice. And even if he does, he's not going to mind. He'll s- smile down benignly from above as this goes on. And James says quite simply, the Lord does mind. He he notices and he minds. Notice with me verse 5. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? The Old Testament teaches us that God is a jealous God in the sense that he desires the exclusive affection and worship of his people. He's jealous in that way. He won't share us. The principle is stated right there in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20 and verse 5, referring to idols. He says, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. 
The Lord is jealous for the exclusive loyalty of his people. He'll, he'll not tolerate a division of that loyalty. And James summarizes the teaching of the scriptures on this point in this way. And it's a summary rather than a quotation. But he summarizes it this way. God yearns jealously over the spirit that he has placed within us. That is, you know, over our inner person. Not the Holy Spirit, I don't think here. But the human spirit that he has created and placed within each of us. The inner me, the person person at my core, my desires, my commitments, my loves. He yearns jealously over the Spirit that He might have each of us in our totality and our completeness. That's His desire. That is His insistence. And so, friends, we need to ask, are you attempting to do the spiritual splits? And am I? Are you attempting to hold on to a kind of Christian commitment, a sort of manageable brand of Christianity that's not too exacting, not too demanding, while also at the same time living as a friend of the world, following its wisdom, serving self and desire and passion, pushing others out of your way and leaving lots of damage all the time in your wake? If so, you are treating the Lord not as your friend, says James, but as your enemy. If so, you're playing a dangerous game one that cannot end well? If so, you need to hear what James has to say to us next. Friendship with the world, it causes fights among people, we see that. It makes people enemies of God, that's sobering. And finally, it calls for humble repentance, verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. The word but is one of the most wonderful words in the Bible on a number of occasions. The scriptures lay out for us what we deserve and how things ought to go for us based on our own behavior. And the word but then suddenly appears within the discussion and it paves the way for a gospel-shaped intervention, a radical change of direction driven by the kindness of God. It becomes the unexpected and the undeserved turning point and that's exactly what we see going on here. See, the truth of the matter is that none of us is free of the outlook and the attitude of the world. There are elements of worldliness in each one of us in this sense. And we deserve, each one of us, to be cast off as enemies of God. There's no question about it. God yearns jealously for our entire spirit. But we are so often, are we not, divided in heart and in mind, so often flawed and failing in outlook and behavior. But, but, and here's the wonder of it, he gives more grace. More grace than we deserve more grace than we have sin, more grace than we have compromise, more grace than we have unfaithfulness within us. He gives more grace. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth and part of a message called Choosing the Right Friendship. It's part of our series, Doers of the Word, a study of the book of James. And today we've been looking at James chapter 4, the first 10 verses there. Maybe you joined us a little late, or you maybe missed a previous broadcast in the series. You can always catch up by coming to our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. We're able to stay on this station because of your generosity to Encounter the Truth. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book that Jonathan's written. It's called The Ministry Medical. It's a health checkup from 2 Timothy. So Jonathan, what is 2 Timothy all about? Second Timothy is a book written by the Apostle Paul and given to a younger ministry colleague by the name of Timothy. And within this book, within this letter, Paul is showing Timothy the nature of faithful gospel ministry, and he is exhorting him to endure in faithfulness in the work that God has called him to do. And within this book, we just gain so much wisdom and so much insight into the nature of true and faithful gospel ministry. And, and it is a treasure trove for pastors, for church elders, for anyone entrusted with any kind of Bible ministry. And, and that's, that's so many Christian people, of course. And, and there are wonderful riches there for us. 
Well, we would love to send you a copy of this book, The Ministry Medical, as our way of saying thank you for your financial support this month. To find out more, give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884 or EncounterTheTruth.org. For Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.